Steam engines come in all shapes and sizes, as we have seen throughout this channel, and the National Railway Museum host many of them. But there is one steam engine that is markedly different from the rest. In fact, it doesn't look like a steam engine at all, but it plays a very important part in railway history, and you can even see it working. The Stanhope and Tyne Railway's winding engine. Yes, I know, a winding engine isn't a steam locomotive, but hear me out. It's well known right from the Middle Ages that if you wanted materials and coal, then one of the richest places to get it was Durham and Northumberland. In the Middle Ages, those precious black rocks were extracted, mostly on the surface using horse and cart and digging small mines. But as the Industrial Revolution took hold in the late 1700s, then the appetite for coal was increasing. Transporting coal or any such material in the quantities that the people demanded was expensive and difficult and mines near to waterways always profited the most due to being able to send the raw material by boat. But soon the mines near the water's edge were depleting so miners were forced to work inland using either public roads or paying a levy to landowners to allow them to cross their land via horse and car. Over time, the pathway divots from the carts paved the way for wagonways consisting of wooden rails. They were an improvement on the previous roads, being more smoother, so were easier on the horses, but they were still notoriously slow. In 1831, an opportunity arose when the Pontop Colliery came up for rent. It was snapped up by William Wallace, who also agreed leases to coal mines at West Consett and a lime quarry at Stanhope. Tramways, wagonways and waterlinks were simply not going to work to interlink the collieries, so what was needed was a railway. At first, to help with costings and to avoid getting permission from Parliament, the landowners that were getting the paid levies agreed to allow a railway on their lands for the same payment as before. And before long, a line from Consett to Stanhope was constructed. But the railway had to get to the mouth of the Tyne and then beyond. After careful deliberation and ideas, including the inclusion of a wagonway, a new company was formed called the Stanhope and Tyne Railway with the sole view of getting the coal to the Tyne and the rest of the UK. At its helm was engineer Thomas Harrison. Thomas was born in London but had spent most of his life up north living with his father who pioneered early railway travel. Thomas went into the family business and fell under the apprenticeship of William Chapman. From there, Thomas found himself working closely with railway legend Robert Stevenson. Together they co-managed the engineering part of the railway, with Stevenson accepting a thousand pounds in stocks and shares for his fees. The scheme was now growing and with the two engineers' help, but the scheme still had to be kept on the down low. Mineral prospectors were very high in competition with one another and if anyone got wind of a railway going in to move raw materials that had no parliamentary assent, then they could ask parliament for the rights and the whole railway would be scuppered. If the railway did go through parliament, then the cat would be out of the bag and people would realise there's profitable mines nearby and try to exploit it. To get around Parliament, the company continued the practice of paying landowners for access to their land, but the landowners in the eastern section saw an opportunity and demanded much higher fees, well in excess of what the railway was paying earlier. The railway had no choice and paid them off annually. In 1832, work began to construct the railway. They started on the more complex terrain near Stanhope and the work on the flatter terrain started two years later. There were talks to merge the railway with the Beamish colliery, but it never came to fruition. The line itself, thanks to the inclines, relied heavily on static engines to get the locomotives up and down the gradients. One of the most famous was the Weatherill incline. This is where the static engine at the Railway Museum was housed and where it worked. 
The engine worked by using over 60 ropes with loads of up to 96 tonnes attached. The ropes would not last long, having to be replaced every 7 to 10 months, and it was average that the engines would haul around about 2,000 to 4,000 tonnes per day. It was a complicated mess of ropes which had to be attached and removed depending if you were climbing or descending. The line also implemented the use of horses rather than locomotives in certain sections due to the descent. It wasn't said that the railway did not use locomotives, they did. In fact, the Robertson Stevenson Company designed and built three of them exclusively for the railway. These were 042 type engines with two driving wheels and a trailing wheel. It was a tender engine and it proved itself to be a good contender for climbing hills. In 1835 the railway moved from not just carrying coal and ore but carrying passengers. At first the fare was free as many passengers simply hopped into a coal wagon. But seeing an opportunity to make money, the railway added coaches to the back of the coal trains. The landowners did not like this one bit as the agreement had only been for ores only and upped their prices to meet this new demand. In 1839, a new junction called the Brandling Junction Railway intersected the Stamhope and Tyne, making it now accessible to other railways via a loop line. But it was too little, too late. Expensive, costly equipment, greedy landowners, failure to thrive had hit the railway hard, and in 1840 the company announced it was unable to pay its debts. The company was down to the tune of £440,000 and it simply could not afford to continue any longer. The Stanhope to Carhouse section of the line was closed in a desperate attempt to claw back funds, but it was no good. On the 29th of December 1840, after exhorting all efforts to save the company, it declared bankruptcy and the search was on to find the new company that would take on the railway. The Pontop and South Shields Railway took up the call in 1842. It raised money by selling the quarries and the closed section of line off and focused on opening lines to allow the route to be connected to Gateshead and beyond. It took two years, but for the first time in its life, it started to make a profit. The line was then swallowed up by the Stockton and Darlington Railway, where it remained right up to the grouping and British Rail. The stationary engine in the Great Hall was built for the railway in 1833 by Hawkes and Son. The giant flywheel is 20 foot in diameter, but it's not original, as the original one was cut for display in an early exhibit many years ago, long before the railway became a national museum. The main cylinder is not original either, as the original one exploded in the 1880s. But luckily the spare cylinder, which was sitting around since 1838, so it's near enough original. The A-frame supporting the engine and flywheel was especially constructed to mount the engine high in the Great Hall and it was converted to electric for demonstration purposes. Despite its age, amazingly it still works and is likely the oldest working exhibit in the museum. The museum used to run the engine twice a day but since Covid, the reopening of the museum and the museum's current makeover, it has seldom run. So if you want to see it running, it's best to check on the day with one of the staff or check it out on YouTube. I suspect there'll be a few videos of it running there. As for the railway, the line was closed in the 1980s and the tracks were taken up, but many remnants of the old line and buildings are still around. The line is now a fantastic walkway with statues showing its past and I would recommend taking a stroll up there, especially if you're up north.